And they started nine minutes before and 11. Oh, yeah. Isn't that so? Really? Oh, maybe my clock was wrong, but I, I thought they started early. Mm -hmm. So I report back that <laughs> this prejudice about uh, Latin people that they are always late is completely wrong. <laughs> More uh, punctual than, uh, than the British, actually, yeah? Well, the prejudice still uh, holds for the Middle East, where I come from. It's the Cubans who do we have any questions that we could start with before we have our formal introduction while we wait for our last comments to read? Do you want to present in English or in Spanish? English, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could in Spanish. I understand Spanish, read it, but I can't speak it. We have seven students from our Middle East Studies program. Uh -huh. And I think that we've been interested in some of your work. In fact, three of them are writing on Palestine. Mm -hmm. In terms of their, they're developing their thesis proposals right now. Uh -huh. And so we're aware of some of your recent work on, on issues in that area. I'm wondering if anyone has any questions or ah, we're all getting scared. Well, why don't we say the questions for after? Yes. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por venir y muchas gracias al doctor Ashkar por aceptar estar aquí. Es una excelente oportunidad eh, de tener al doctor Ashkar acá con nosotros el día de hoy. Y permítanme presentarlo brevemente antes de dar la palabra para la conferencia. El doctor Ashkar es profesor de la Escuela de Estudios Orientales y Africanos, SOAS, de la Universidad de Londres. Realizó sus estudios de licenciatura y maestría en filosofías y ciencias sociales en Beirut, Líbano. Y su doctorado en Historia Social y Relaciones Internacionales en la Universidad de París 8. Ha publicado numerosos libros y artículos acerca de la estrategia global de Estados Unidos y acerca del Medio Oriente. Destacan Los Árabes y el Holocausto, La Guerra Árabe-Israelí de Narrativas, 2009 en francés, 2010 en inglés. Estados Peligrosos, Oriente Medio y la Política Exterior Estadounidense, en coautoría con Noam Chomsky, publicado en español por Pai 2 en el 2007. La Guerra de los 33 Días, La Guerra Israelí contra Hezbollah en Líbano y sus consecuencias, en coautoría con Michel Warshawski, y publicado en español por Icari en el 2007. El choque de las barbaries, terrorismo y desorden mundial, publicado en español también por Icari en el 2007, y Caldera Oriental, Islam, Afganistán, Palestina e Irak, en un espejo marxista, publicado en 2003 en francés y en inglés. La conferencia del día de hoy, titulada La política exterior de Estados Unidos hacia el Medio Oriente y la luna allí, va a ser el tema que el doctor Ashkar nos va a ofrecer. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a vosotros. Thank you very much. <coughs> And uh, well, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to to, well, to meet you first, meet all of you, and also to have this uh, discussion with, uh, I think, uh, probably the majority of people here in the room are uh, experts or future experts on the Middle East. So uh, this, I'm sure, will lead to an interesting <coughs> discussion. Um, yes, the, the, the topic, as I've been told by Berto, uh, has been uh, uh, more oriented toward the uh, Shia Sunni issue related to the Middle East for this uh, particular lecture, which which is a, a welcome uh, opportunity for me to to uh, to speak of something else than what I've been uh, speaking about uh, a few hours ago because I gave just uh, gave a lecture at UNAM uh, on, uh, well, also partly the same topic, I mean, the global strategy of the United States and the Middle East, and the, the, the place of the Middle East in this global strategy. Uh, so here, instead of repeating for the second time the, 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 the same talk, which has been, anyhow, if anyone is interested in the other much more general topic. It has been uh, filmed, recorded, and it 
probably also could, uh, when this, we're discussing that uh, around lunch, uh, it will probably be uh, published also in a transcript form. I mean, the discussion between me and Dr. Uh, John Sachs uh, Fernandez. So, um, now here, when I, I will summarize uh, the, the, maybe the s some starting points and then uh, discuss this, this whole issue of uh, the Shia-Sunni uh, divide as it developed in recent years uh, uh, in, in the Middle East. Well, first, about the, I mean, <coughs> let's say the, the more general picture. Um, the, the, the Middle East uh, has become, has always been, in a sense, uh, in the 20th century, a uh, major concern of uh, U.S. Uh, global strategy. And especially ever since the United States uh, has risen to the status of, uh, of global power, uh, especially of, uh, I mean, around the, uh, <coughs> during the time of the Second World War. Uh, the, I mean, U.S. involvement in the Middle East started in the uh, post-World War I period when the United States attempted or tried to, to, to get uh, its piece of the cake uh, in the uh, division of the, the uh, Ottoman Empire's uh, legacy in the Middle East and uh, ended up in getting uh, the piece of land that no one uh, was interested in, which uh, turned to be the Saudi Kingdom, uh, which uh, turned to, to be by far the most important piece of the cake, the oil cake, because as you know, Saudi Kingdom is by far the most important uh, country in the world in terms of oil reserves. It, alone, it represents some 25%, uh, some quarter of, of uh, the world oil reserves. And the Middle East, I mean, the, the, the region around the Arab-Persian Gulf uh, holds uh, two-thirds of uh, world oil reserves, so it is a matter of a huge strategic interest, which start getting uh, at the center of world attention with the shift from coal toward oil uh, that was accelerated by the First World War and what followed, and uh, and therefore the, the the issue of oil uh, was as I mean one of the key issues. Although this is not always uh, underlined or emphasized by historians, but it already was a major uh, issue in the First World War. And, uh, and since then, uh, it became a major strategic concern. And of course, as I said, in the course of uh, World War II, this, is, this was a very, very important uh, uh, consideration. And the United States, therefore, <coughs> uh, uh, well, cultivated this uh, special link that uh, it uh, was able to, uh, to build with the, the Saudi Kingdom. And that's how also, I mean, uh, the Saudi king, Ibn Saud, was among the, the rare people that, uh, I mean, Roosevelt uh, met on the way back from, uh, from Yalta. So that was in itself an indication of the importance of that. And one of the main military bases of the United States after, uh, I mean, yes, after the Second World War was in the Saudi kingdom, in Dahran, that is, in the heart of the oil rich area of the Saudi, of the Saudi Kingdom, which, by the way, also is a Shiite, the Shiite uh, province uh, of, uh, of the Saudi Kingdom. Um, uh, and, well, uh, during the Cold War, as we know, the Middle East was one of the main theaters of the Cold War. Uh, <coughs> and the United States resented very much uh, the fact that it was compelled to uh, leave uh, I mean, to evacuate the uh, Dahran bases in the early 60s under the pressure of, uh, of, uh, of Arab nationalism, of Nasser, Nasser's Egypt, denouncing the hypocrisy of the Saudi ruling family and the Wahhabis as uh, having a fundamentalist discourse and uh, welcoming a U.S. military base on, on their soil. So 
they were they felt compelled to ask the United States to evacuate this this uh, this places, and that was a major setback for the United States, which since then uh, uh, looked forward to 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 returning. Uh, I mean to. Uh, uh, rebuilding uh, its uh, direct military presence in the region. Uh, but this turn of events in the 60s uh, was uh, um, one of the key reasons, if not the key reason, which turned the state of Israel into a, a strategic uh, asset for, uh, for the United States. And contrary to some uh, visions that uh, we can find today where I mean, people, some people uh, get even to uh, fantasmatic views of Israel uh, dictating the foreign policy of the United States, or at least the Middle East policy of the United States. The fact is that uh, it's, n it's only from the mid-60s, actually, that this, uh, the kind of uh, close U.S.-Israeli partnership uh, was established. Uh, and the 67 war was the first Israeli war's real U.S. backing, while, whereas the, uh, well, the first Arab-Israeli war uh, was at the time of uh, U.S. embargo to all parties of the, of the conflict, and the 56 war was condemned by the United States, which uh, ordered <coughs> uh, the three countries that aggressed Egypt in 56 to, to, uh, to, to stop their aggression and, and withdraw. So, the, the, there has been a shift, but that was in the 60s, when the United States was compelled to, to and then was losing ground with uh, Syria, Egypt, and these countries shifting to the side of the Soviet Union and, uh, and the Cold War, and therefore uh, uh, Israel became a major strategic asset for an ally for the United States. Uh, it, it, it's the beginning of a transformation which will turn Israel as a, in a kind of uh, proxy force for the United States in the Middle East, or at least seen like that by the United States, and the 67 uh, victory of the Israeli army against the Arab armies were, was, of course, uh, decisive in enhancing the value of uh, of this uh, this strategic uh, this strategic ally. Now. <clears throat> uh, we know how, I mean, the uh, United States, uh, when uh, it uh, was facing uh, probably its most uh, difficult years uh, since uh, the Second World War in the late 60s and early 70s, when the United States was uh, losing ground uh, at, at a global level, uh, and uh, was facing a, a real uh, decline in its uh, uh, global hegemony, whether at the economic level or military, political, with the Vietnam, uh, the, uh, the Vietnam fiasco of the United States. Uh, we, uh, I mean, people tend to, uh, let's say, overlook the fact that uh, for the United States, uh, the evacuation, I mean, the departure from Vietnam, the withdrawal from Vietnam, was compensated, and I would say even uh, circumpens overcompensated, by uh, the uh, shift of Egypt from the Soviet camp to the uh, uh, U.S. side. And in a sense, in strategic terms, f for the United States, I mean, if you put in the balance losing Vietnam and winning Egypt in the heart of the Middle East, Egypt was much more important in the strategic sense because of the issue of oil and uh, in the whole region. So that was a f first and initial step. So while the U.S. was losing ground in Indochina, uh, in Southeast Asia, it was uh, gaining ground in the Middle East uh, in the early early 70s. Uh, but it it wasn't until uh, 1990 with the on the one hand, the paralysis and f future demise of the Soviet Union, and uh, um, uh, uh, on the other hand, the, um, uh, the the situation created by uh, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in August 1990. So it wasn't until that time that the United States uh, uh, found a real opportunity to 
not only come back militarily to uh, to the uh, the Middle East and especially to the Saudi Kingdom actually, or to the area of the Gulf, but even to come back in a absolutely massive character. And actually, that was the first massive deployment of U.S. troops since Vietnam. Uh, be, for the <coughs> between Vietnam between the evacuation of Vietnam in '73 and uh, and the uh, and the Gulf War for 16, 17 years, with the exception of well, the little um, let's say uh, initial step in Panama in '89, but that was very you know on a very small scale, but the, the real let's say, uh, a resumption of uh, massive military intervention in the United States was, uh, was in, the, in the Gulf War, uh, the, the first one for the United States, and uh, with a military deployment at the on the scale in terms of troops of that of, of, uh, of Vietnam, and with a deployment of, uh, of, uh, of uh, aviation, uh, Navy and all that, which uh, was an unprecedented kind of concentration of, of forces uh, since the time of, uh, of the Second World War. So that that was uh, that was a huge and and um, uh, th this will affect this uh, the fact that the United States uh, could come back to the region will affect the um, I mean many factors, but uh, one of them being uh, the the kind of relation that uh, uh, will develop uh, between Israel and the United States but I, I, I'll get back uh, I'll get back to that uh, first let me also say that uh, the uh, uh, ground that was gained uh, in the Middle East uh, through uh, through Egypt uh, by the United States uh, was very much uh, affected by the uh, Iranian Revolution in 1979. And there, the United States, after having uh, uh, made a, a major, <coughs> uh, uh, achieved a major uh, victory for its strategic interest in Egypt, a few years later, will lose one of its key allies for the whole region and lose it for uh, a revolution led by a regime which became the, the fiercest uh, enemy of the United States uh, in the region with a very uh, harsh, uh, radical, uh, anti-US uh, kind of, uh, of rhetoric. And well, you know the, the events that followed the Iranian revolution, the hostages uh, in the US uh, embassy in Tehran, and, uh, and all the rest. And uh, how, how did the United States cope with that? Well, uh, at that time, uh, the initial reaction was that uh, this was mainly a Shiite uh, problem, or let's say the Shiite brand of Islamic fundamentalism was uh, then considered to be hostile to U.S. interest. Um, at the same time, the United States carried on uh, the kind of policies that uh, it had been following uh, during the, uh, from the initial stage of, of the Cold War uh, in the region, which was through the alliance with the Saudi Kingdom to use Islamic fundamentalism uh, as a major ideological weapon in the fight against uh, uh, left-wing Arab nationalism Soviet influence, communism, uh, anything uh, you want on that level. I mean, the the Saudi Kingdom, uh, which is the by far the oldest ally of the United States in the Middle East, long before the State of Israel even came into being, uh, actually, and uh, well, happens also to be uh, the most fundamentalist state uh, on earth. I mean, the the Wahhabi. Uh, interpretation of Islam is the, the, the most fundamentalist, puritanical, and uh, uh, regressive kind of interpretation of Islam that one can can uh, can think of, and uh, and yet this was the the closest ally of the United States, which didn't have any problem, you know, uh, cultivating close ties with uh, with the state, and this also shows us 
the the very high level of hypocrisy that uh, exists in uh, in uh, the, the kind of uh, rhetoric that we have been hearing since '79, actually about uh, Iran, and you know, because <coughs> the I mean, whatever one thinks of Iran, compared to the Saudi Kingdom, it's a paragon of uh, of uh, democracy and women's liberation. Uh, I mean, compared to the Saudi Kingdom. So, uh, and here is the the hypocrisy. Uh, playing uh, its role. Anyhow, uh, so, the, I mean, the United States wanted to convince itself that the problem was just Iran, so therefore the problem was the Shia brand of Sunni fundamentalism, whereas the, the Sunni was under uh, Saudi uh, tutelage and posed no, uh, no threat, and they continued, they carried on uh, the same uh, policies, which of course reached a climax with Afghanistan. Uh, after '79, after the Soviet invasion of uh, of Afghanistan, as uh, everybody knows, uh, the United States, in conjunction with the Saudi Kingdom and Pakistan, were uh, major backers of the uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan. So the, the uh, which who I mean the Mujahideen, uh, which also were Islamic fundamentalist forces. Uh, so with with U.S., uh, Saudi, and Pakistani uh, backing, and uh, uh, the the same year, 1990, which in which uh, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait offered uh, or provided the United States with the opportunity to uh, uh, come back militarily massively, uh, or even to to deploy for troops uh, massively in the region. Uh, the same year, uh, so uh, uh, a shift in uh, Sunni Islamic fundamentalism, uh, well, uh, probably best illustrated by uh, Al-Qaeda, I mean, bin Laden himself, who turned uh, after the U.S. deployment in the Saudi Kingdom from uh, someone who had fought alongside uh, U.S.-backed uh, forces uh, in Afghanistan into uh, someone who became, in his turn, uh, one of the, uh, let's say, uh, fiercest enemies uh, of uh, of the United States uh, in in the Middle East. And since then, the United States has been facing, actually, uh, uh, the two, let's say, Islamic fundamentalism within the two branches of Islam. Uh, with uh, oriented against the United States, uh, of course, this didn't um, uh, cancel the, I mean, the uh, uh, existence of the Saudi Kingdom, and uh, therefore, a brand of uh, of Islamic fundamentalism uh, still uh, closely allied with the United States. But what we uh, we saw was this emergence of uh, of of Al Qaeda uh, uh, as uh, representing this shift, which I mean, I, I mentioned Al Qaeda because it's the, the most spectacular, but uh, this was uh, uh, rather pervasive in the Islamic fundamentalist uh, movement. If we take the Muslim Brotherhood, which until then, having been uh, closely allied with the Saudi Kingdom, was considered as rather, um, let's say, uh, friendly uh, strategically. I mean, the, 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 this whole current shifted also in 1990 into a, a, a position which uh, was an anti-U.S. position, and uh, they were catering to, to their mass constituency uh, because of the uh, very sharp resentment that uh, followed the uh, U.S. Uh, intervention uh, in the Gulf and uh, the war, uh, the war against uh, against Iraq. Now, <clears throat> so this this year, 1990 is uh, 1990 and 91 uh, is a, a major uh, turning point. It's a real watershed. Uh, I mean, in the history of the region, it's also watershed in a sense at the global level, because also these those are the years where the Soviet Union will. Uh, will uh, leave the, the scene of history. But uh, for the Middle East, it's very obviously an uh, absolutely major uh, uh, watershed. And after 1990, 
uh, what the United States uh, will, will, uh, will try to do is to uh, consolidate uh, a hegemony in the Middle East uh, which had uh, uh, reached a point, uh, an unprecedented level, uh, historically speaking, because of the demise of the Soviet Union, because of, of, uh, of, of the shift of conditions in the region, and the way that the United States waged the, 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 the war against Iraq with the uh, conjunction of, of regimes from the, from the region, uh, including not only traditional allies of the United States, but even the Syrian regime, which uh, joined the uh, US-led coalition uh, at the time. So US hegemony appeared as a peak in 1990, uh, 91, it appeared as a peak, uh, as being at a peak in the region. But at the same time, uh, you had this shift in Islamic fundamentalist forces, uh, the Sunni Sunni brand, uh, which uh, will uh, uh, become a major uh, worry uh, for the United States and a major threat for uh, U.S. interests in the region uh, for for the year beyond that. Now, the uh, I mean, the, uh, the war against Iraq uh, already in 1990-91 uh, I mean, involved very much uh, the Iranian dimension in the sense that, um, as you all know, uh, Iraq is a, a Shiite majority uh, country. Uh, I mean, there's a uh, big uh, Sunni uh, minority, if we take Arab Sunnis or uh, the Kurds, but even together they represent uh, a minority of the population. It's very large, but still, I mean, the majority, close to two-thirds or at least 60 percent of the population uh, are Shia. And um, the United States, under Bush Sr., waged the war against Iraq um, in relatively difficult political conditions. That is, the Bush administration, the Bush senior administration, uh, had to really wage a very intensive political battle, in, uh, a domestic political battle in the United States to get the green light for the war. And they got it was one vote, once in eight vote difference. So that was uh, at a time when the so-called Vietnam syndrome was still very strong in the United States. So in a sense, the Gulf crisis uh, will uh, uh, allow the, the US government to, uh, or at least they believed so, to uh, overcome this the so-called syndrome. Uh, but still, the fact that this was wa uh, waged, I mean, this war was waged under such political conditions meant that uh, the Bush uh, administration, the Bush senior administration, had no political uh, 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 mandate for an occupation of Iraq. There, there was no possibility to occupy the country and therefore to rule to the country directly. And in such conditions, well, they preferred to keep Saddam Hussein in power because the alternative to Saddam Hussein, they thought, would be pro-Iranian. And that's how uh, when you had the uprising in southern Iraq in 91, in March 91, uh, the United States uh, facilitated uh, the repression of the uprising by the troops of Saddam Hussein, very clearly. Uh, the U.S. Army in Iraq even withdrew to leave the passage for troops, the Republican Guard sent from Baghdad to the south to quell the uprising. Why so? Because they saw the uprising uh, in the Shia, uh, the Shia uh, South, as threatening with uh, you know a Shia seizure of power in in Baghdad, which might turn into a pro-Iranian government. So this uh, consideration uh, was very much uh, present in uh, in 1991, and also I mean this kind of consideration was very much. Uh, favored by the Saudis. Uh, the Saudis were even more afraid than the United States of uh, a Shiite uh, takeover uh, in Iran because, well, as I said, uh, uh, 
you, you know, there's a Shiite minority in the Saudi Kingdom, which is a very oppressed minority, uh, by the way, and it so happens that this minority is in the oil-rich uh, region of, uh, of, uh, of the kingdom. And uh, so Saddam Hussein was kept, I mean, left in power. Uh, uh, he was uh, authorized to quell the repression in the north and the south. And the policy of the United States uh, after 91 was that called dual containment. A dual containment meaning containing Saddam Hussein, but also containing Iran. And containing <coughs> so, uh, Iraq was, I mean, as you know, done by the embargo, which had disastrous consequences for the Iraqi population, a huge cost in human lives, uh, estimated to be uh, close to one million uh, uh, persons. So, I mean, this is uh, a, a real crime against humanity in the way that this uh, embargo was implemented. But that's, uh, let's say, another uh, discussion. Now, <coughs> this dual containment uh, uh, was not meant to be a permanent policy. The, the, of course, the objective was regime change in both countries. Uh, the objective was to, to, I mean, for a country which, after decades of containing the Soviet Union, saw the collapse of communism, and Soviet Union being a major superpower, uh, of course, I mean, with uh, much smaller and weaker states like Iraq and Iran, containment was uh, uh, just a step before rollback, rolling back, or let's say defeating and changing uh, the regime. But for that, uh, political conditions were needed. And here we see that despite everything that has been said, uh, there is a, a resilience of the so-called Vietnam syndrome in the sense that uh, uh, the, United, the U.S. government uh, do, uh, does not have, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, is not free-handed in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, <clears throat> implementing uh, whatever kind of military uh, policies uh, it wants to implement. It, it, is, it, it faces a, a lot of constraints. And therefore, uh, what we see is uh, the, the rising pressure from some segments in the United States for uh, the invasion of Iraq uh, during the Clinton administration, but a Clinton administration which didn't have the uh, possibility of implementing that. And it took a, a change in, uh, uh, a major change uh, in the political condition uh, for that to become possible, even after the Bush Jr. Uh, team came to power. And although we know that these people very much wanted um, several years before arriving to power, uh, they were advocating regime change in Iraq. I mean, themselves, when, when they reached power, had, uh, didn't have the, the, I mean, at least immediately, the political opportunity to do that. It took 9-11 to create the conditions for uh, the implementation of this uh, this kind uh, of of, uh, of of program. Now, um, when uh, Bush faced the, the, the George W. Bush administration uh, faced the invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, they conducted the, the war in in a sense which is. Actually, when you think of it, uh, very uh, paradoxical and uh, and complex. Uh, and th the fact is that they wanted to believe that the occupation of Iraq will be something uh, uh, relatively smooth, uh, which wouldn't need a lot of troops, which would be relatively easy and will be accepted by the population. But I said, by which population? By the Shia population in Iraq, if you think of it. I mean, here and here you get you start getting into the whole complexity of the thing. So the, the calculation of the Bush administration about the, the uh, uh, <coughs> occupation of Iraq was based on their assumption of the attitude of the Shia. Now, the Shia, for, I mean, they thought that uh, they uh, would have, uh, uh, let's say, a favorably inclined uh, Shiite population, uh, but through, through what? Through who, who was the, the key 
uh, architect uh, of the, uh, I mean, the Iraqi dimension of the, uh, uh, the, Ira the, the Iraq policy of the United States, uh, uh, Shalabi. Shalabi was himself uh, a Shia, but Shalabi organized a kind of coalition of forces which included uh, pro-Iran forces, the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution uh, in Iraq. So here already we have a, a big paradox of this uh, Bush, uh, George W. Bush administration wanting to uh, invade Iraq and betting on winning the Iraqi Shia, uh, but playing a kind of, let's say, uh, in their belief, a very Machiavellian game or very smart game uh, in, you know, uh, this kind of broad alliance, including pro-Iranian forces. Um, well, what happened, uh, I mean, is that this kind of calculation that I, uh, they had proved to be completely, completely wrong. And actually, they, were, they had two options when they uh, invaded uh, Iraq. One option was to uh, cut a deal with the Iraqi army. They had some dealings with the head of the Iraqi army and uh, get, I mean, have some kind of putsch, some kind of coup uh, in Baghdad and, uh, you know, uh, cooperate with the the, the, the basic structure of, uh, of the apparatus, the state apparatus remaining uh, there, but, well, removing Saddam Hussein and his, and his group and getting something else. And that's what the Saudis wanted, which would have uh, um, guaranteed a certain continuity of Sunni-dominated uh, power in Iraq. And then you have uh, the Shalabi represented option, uh, uh, backed by the neocons. The neocons themselves uh, very much linked to Israel and wanting a very weak Iraqi state. So advocating uh, the total dismantlement of the uh, apparatus, the state apparatus in Iraq, total dismantlement of the state apparatus and, uh, uh, you know, for reshaping completely the whole state uh, under uh, U.S. Uh, tutelage. Uh, and that was the, the option that was followed. But this proved deadly to U.S. interests. This proved deadly to U.S. interests. The miscalculation was terrible. And what could be easily expected, actually, is that uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq uh, benefited Iran much more, actually, than the United States itself. I mean, the ben uh, main beneficiary of the U.S. invasion of, of, uh, of Iraq turned to be Iran, which actually was the Machiavellian player much more than the Bush administration in, uh, in, uh, in this regard. And, uh, of course, we have seen how the, the clout of Iran increased tremendously after uh, 2003 and started also increasing at the regional level, enhanced by other factors. Uh, the uh, uh, victory achieved by Hezbollah in Lebanon with the uh, evacuation of Israeli troops in the year 2000, after 18 years of occupation, or more than 18 if we just consider South Lebanon, because it started in 78 in, in South Lebanon. Uh, so the, the Iran's clout in the region was rising uh, in a, a very strong manner. And the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, which was the kind of counterweight for, for Iran, also benefited in itself, already benefited Iran uh, uh, a lot. All that happened to the huge dismay of the Saudis and all the Arab allies of the United States, especially, I mean, who are the Arab allies of the United States? They are the Gulf Cooperation Council six members, so the oil monarchies and the other statelets there, Egypt and Jordan. These eight countries uh, are the, let's say, what, what they are called in the region uh, uh, America's Arabs. That's how they call them in the Middle East. And it takes bizarre forms, you know, like uh, uh, having Condoleezza Rice, for instance, going and meeting the eight 
many, I mean, representatives of the eight states at the same time, although there's no structure. There's no structure. I mean, you have the Gulf Cooperation Council, but there are six states. But meeting the Gulf Cooperation Council plus, uh, I mean, ministers of that, plus Jordan and Egypt has no sense but the United States meeting with its vessels in the region. I mean, this is very blatant. And there they got, I mean, a real dismay about what, what, uh, what was happening. And uh, that's the time and the period when the, the King of Jordan, uh, uh, you know, pronounced this famous phrase about the Shiite crescent uh, threatening the region. And there's a kind of crescent going from Tehran through Iraq to Lebanon. Yes? And of course, meaning that there, there are others, there are Bahrain, there, you have the, the Saudi uh, Shiite province, uh, and that therefore there is a kind of Shiite threat. Um, why, why did they uh, do so? Uh, wh why this characterization? Well, it's obvious why. I mean, um, what we have seen after 2003, and uh, in a very spectacular manner after Ahmadinejad uh, won the elections in Iran in 2005, because he will be a main player in that, is a kind of ideological battle between the uh, let's say, America's Arabs, or mainly uh, the Saudis here playing a major role, plus the Jordan, Egypt, and the rest, uh, and, and Iran over winning the hearts and minds of the Arab Sunnis. How does it, does it translate? I mean, Iran started outbidding any kind of Arab state on the issue of Israel. And that's how you can understand Ahmadinejad's pronouncements about the Holocaust and all that, which are not stemming from any kind of anti-Semitism. They are mostly a very opportunistic kind of, of statements to outbid uh, the Saudis, and the Wahhabis, in uh, the kind of discourse which is, which, with which they are very familiar because the Wahhabi discourse is very anti-Semitic, actually. And therefore, you had Iran outbidding uh, the Saudis, and the Saudis not able to retaliate on the same level because of the United States, <laughs> because of Israel, and because of the whole set of policies, policies in which they were engaged, and therefore having no card against Iran on the ideological level except the sectarian one, the Shia. And this will play a major role in the kind of civil war, in the exacerbation of the civil war in Iraq. And the Saudis, the Wahhabis, we know, I mean, had a lot of channels through which they, and this is the, the whole, con I mean, you know, Middle East politics for, uh, and for, for instance, for Europeans are a headache because yeah. everything is mixed. It's very complex. And, uh, and you have behind the scene uh, more things happening than on the top of the scene. And that's why also actually you can't blame the Middle East for being probably the, the region of the world where conspiracy theories uh, are, uh, you know, most uh, widespread. But because real conspiracies are so many in the region that people tend to see conspiracies in everything. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's what, uh, what uh, actually uh, happened. And, <clears throat> well, the U.S., uh, the Bush, I mean, the Bush neocon uh, Iraqi policy turned to be a total disaster, a real failure. And that's when the Saudis themselves were exceeded by that, also were, I mean, very much resenting that. And that's when, more important, the Saudis, the, the, the U.S. establishment, uh, came into the picture to, to limit the damage. I mean, because uh, the damage done by the Bush administration to U.S. interests has been tremendous, absolutely huge. And that's the time when you had the uh, Baker-Hamilton bipartisan Iraq study group, uh, which uh, reconsidered everything and, of course, uh, was sharply critical of the, uh, everything that has been followed uh, until then in Iraq. Uh, this led, under, I mean, putting the, the Bush administration under pressure, uh, this led the Bush administration to uh, severe the links with the neocons. They were just they went out from the administration. Wolfowitz was sent, was sent to the World Bank. Uh, and uh, Rumsfeld himself, although he's not a neocon, but he was, I mean, the, the Pentagon was the, 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 the stronghold of, of the neocons. Rumsfeld himself 
who was very much identified with the uh, options followed in Iraq after 2003, had, had to leave. And the real turning point in U.S. foreign policy is not Bush to Obama, is under Bush in 2006. And there is more continuity between the last two years of Bush and Obama than discontinuity, uh, as people think. The, the real discontinuity is between before 2006 and 2006, the surge. The surge, which is what uh, Obama is trying now in Afghanistan, increase the troops and try to buy the locals, the local uh, tribes. So in Iraq, they increased the troops and they bought Sunni tribes with the help of the Saudis. And they managed to, uh, you know, get the allegiance of a lot of Sunni tribes, but this is very fragile because it's based on money. Uh, you know, what they pay to the uh, uh, tribes that, uh, they are, that are under uh, U.S., I mean, that are functioning with the U.S. Uh, in, in Iraq, in terms of uh, Iraqi money, is a huge because they, they pay $300 per, I mean, per, 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 uh, per man, uh, men uh, only. <laughs> but $300 in present day Iraq is uh, a lot of money. A lot of money. But of course, from, seen from the point of view of U.S. interest, uh, 200,000 people, you pay $300 per, per person, it's still a little fraction of the cost of, uh, of the war in Iraq, of the occupation of Iraq. And it's much more effective, actually, than, than uh, a lot of other things. So that's how it was conducted. And uh, uh, the U.S. put harsh pressure to, to uh, you know, get rid of, um, of Jafari, where I won't get into details, have Maliki, with whom they thought would be more uh, uh, flexible. But what we have seen, that was the other part of the recommendation of the Baker-Hamilton thing, is talk to Iran. Talk to Iran. The Bush administration did not do it at a central level very much, but in Iraq they did it. And the surge was accompanied with agreements between I Iran and the United States in Iraq. And the Maliki government is fundamentally, uh, you know, uh, supported by, by, the, by Washington and Tehran at the same time. And this is the, the whole paradox of the two regimes cooperating in Iraq uh, because of opportunistic interests of both, a convergence in Iraq, at the same time having this kind of uh, confrontation at the more general level. Although the Obama administration, more than the Bush administration, here there's uh, some uh, difference, uh, uh, was more uh, uh, flexible in implementing the talk to Iran policy than uh, the Bush administration was at a central level. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, this whole picture is uh, also complicated by uh, the role of uh, Israel in that regard. Israel, which is pushing very hardly on the Iranian issue. As we know, and contrary to Mersheimer and Walt's uh, theory about uh, the Israel lobby behind, being behind the Iraq war, actually Israel, the Sharon government tried to convince the Bush administration to attack Iran instead of Iraq because Iran was seen and rightly so, as the main enemy. Iraq was completely exhausted, uh, Saddam Hussein's ir Iraq. Um, and uh, uh, Israel today is pushing very hard on the issue of Iran, on an Obama administration which has been trying to appease Iran in some way and try to cut some deals, but which, which is faced by, by an Iranian government uh, which uh, is uh, not very cooperative, let's say, in that sense. Uh, and uh, why isn't it uh, that cooperative? It is because they feel and they know that the United States uh, is much weakened. The United States has been much weakened by uh, the, the failure in Iraq, and it is weakened by the situation in Afghanistan. And this weakening of the United States emboldened Iran, the Iranian government, in the attitude, in its attitude, but it also, in a sense, emboldens Israel because Israel knows that Therefore, the U.S. government is not in a position to exert pressure on Israel on the Palestinian issue. And that's why you have an Israeli government feeling completely free to do whatever they, they want uh, uh, towards the Palestinian, knowing that Washington will maybe express some criticism but won't act. 
And you can compare this with the situation in 1991 when the Bush senior administration was at the peak of what they thought at that time. They, they thought at that time that they were very strong and therefore they exerted on Israel, on Shamir's government, uh, uh, the most intensive pressure uh, uh, since the 60s the, that ever existed between, uh, I mean, from Washington on, uh, on, uh, uh, on, uh, on Israel for the uh, Palestinian issue. So that's where we stand now. Very complex situation, absolutely complex situation, a, a lot of, of gain. And to be frank, uh, the complexity of po politics in the Middle East really takes uh, smarter people than the Bush administration to deal, mm -hmm. to deal with it because it is, I mean, it's one of the most complicated uh, situations and it really needs very shrewd people to be dealing with. I'm not sure even that the, the Obama administration has all the uh, competence that is uh, needed for that. Uh, but anyhow, they are on a, on a rather defensive uh, character, trying to limit the damage uh, and uh, uh, to, to move forward from, from there and try to, to secure the most important strategic interest, which is related, of course, to the issue of oil and control of oil. Where are we going from here? It's really very difficult. I mean, probably the the, the the country, I mean, the, the region of the world where uh, uh, making uh, uh, prognosis is the, the most risky is the Middle East because, I mean, it's, uh, the, the conditions keep uh, changing. It's like chaos uh, theory there. And that's how in the weather, you know, the forecast for the weather uh, in the long run cannot work. You can't, you can't have a real uh, forecast over uh, a few hours, uh, 24 hours, uh, 48 hours. Middle East exactly, is exactly the, the, this kind of situation. So it's very difficult to tell. The situation is still very tense. Uh, the uh, tensions with Iran uh, are increasing, but Israel is pushing hard, whether against uh, Iran uh, on the nuclear issue or uh, through the proxy as seen by Israel, represented by Hezbollah, uh, in Lebanon, the probability of, of a new uh, offensive uh, on Lebanon is very high. Uh, the uh, probability of uh, Israel attacking Iran is low because uh, it's much more difficult and it would need going, uh, I mean, it needs a, a green light from the United States. For the time being, this is not granted, but uh, I mean, uh, the situation of Lebanon uh, could, be, could ignite uh, something at the le level of the region. So we have to uh, follow all that carefully, but keeping in mind uh, all the complexity of the situation. I hope I haven't spoken too long, but this is a very complex situation. Thank you very much. <coughs> of playing the odds. That is, there are more Sunnis in the world than there are Shias, so it's easier for us to get what we want by aligning ourselves with Sunnis rather than Shias, especially since Sunnis basically consider Shias to be heretical and blah, 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 blah. Right? So that's one way of showing our political alignments, which is cheaper. Right? That's a way of saving resources, basically, by aligning ourselves with one group rather than the other. Is, is it that simple, or are there more? Is there more to that sort of loyalty that the U.S. demonstrates for its students? And how is that damaged by the Iraq situation, in which the U.S. suddenly started saying, "No, it's not the Shias who are bad; it's the Sunnis who are bad." Right? Although that sort of rose as a peak and then disappeared again. Yes. Uh, well, uh, you. you yeah, so, uh, somebody chairing the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about uh, the domestic politics in, in, in Iran? How, how, how this kind of affect? Because uh, nowadays there is a lot of repression in, inside the country. There, there are like many divisions. I mean, uh, this uh, 
this group uh, supporting Hatami is having a lot of trouble. And maybe there are more repressions than in, in the Shad at the time. And how, how can that affect even in, I don't know, yeah. in, in foreign policy? Maybe it will be better for people and then. It's a very uh, concrete uh, question. Uh, what is the, com the complexity of the Iranian engagement inside Iraq? Because uh, what's the role of Muqtada Sadr in Iraq and with Iran? And how does Iran play the different cards with the Maliki, with the Muqtada Sadr? How do they manage to balance? Yeah. Back to the nuclear issue. Um, the Saudis last week, if I'm not mistaken, mentioned that um, sanctions alone would not be enough mm -hmm. for the Iranians. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what they meant by that. Do they mean to follow up on Obama, to push Obama to engage them more, or harder line? Yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, as you wish. Overall, you haven't mentioned the other countries, for example, the Chinese. The Chinese are very much uh, in relation with Iran, and they are playing a role in that region. I am completely ignorant of what they do in the Middle East. But they are present in Africa and in the Middle East. How would the Chinese intervene in all these pictures of your Okay. You can. Uh, yeah. Well, in this, in all this uh, complicated dynamic in the international relations, uh, in a specific way in the Persian Gulf, I would like to know what is the role that is played by the oil monarchies, the little oil monarchies. Uh, its its role is only to be behind the Saudis. They are just following the Saudis in their alliance with the United States, or they have a more active role that can uh, have an impact in the international, international relations. Let's say in a very general way in terms of uh, actors and time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <coughs> well, um, I think the, uh, starting with the question about the, or the <coughs> comment about Sunnis and Shia in the United States, uh, how the, is the United States uh, dealing uh, with that? Um, I, I think that, I mean, if you follow the, the kind of discourses, you, you've had everything said and it's contrary <laughs> on that. So it's purely adaptative, you know, it's adaptative. It's, uh, I don't think there is, a, I mean, th of course there are, around the administration, people would have this or that kind of feeling. For instance, you have someone advocating a privileged relation with the Shia, like Veli Nasser, for instance, was one of the members of, I mean, the, let's say, foreign policy establishment uh, in the United States. Uh, but um, uh, basically, I mean, I mean, I don't think that ultimately, uh, it's a matter, even I mean, seen from Washington, of Shia or uh, and, uh, versus Sunni, but rather of <coughs> pro-Western and anti-Western. Whether Shia or Sunni doesn't matter. So, because they see what Iran is building up, Iran is building up a, a, a coalition, which Iran is very keen on presenting as Islamic and not Shia. So, whereas. America's allies in the uh, Arab world try to isolate Iran as Shia. Iran retaliates, if you want, by uh, with raising the pan-Islamic banner. And that's why for Iran, Hamas is a major ally. It's very important for Iran to uh, build this relation with Hamas, which is Sunni, of course, and the most prestigious 
or let's say positively seen uh, 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 fraction of Islamic fundamentalism, uh, Sunni Islamic fundamentalism. The, the Muslim Brotherhood in general, when, uh, when Ahmadinejad, and that's the meaning of what I said, when Ahmadinejad made his uh, statements about the Holocaust and all that, it, uh, again, I mean, it's not, uh, it was not aimed at Europe or the United States. It was aimed at the Middle East, and he got open support from the supreme guide of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Ahmed Aq, came up openly saying, he's right, we support what he's saying. And that was seen as a political victory for Iran. So this is the battle, as I said, for the hearts and minds of, of the Sunni. So the United States, I think, basically in Washington, they understand that. They are not... They are not that simplistic to believe that's a matter of Sunnis or Shia, but they, as they have seen that Sunnis can be Bin Laden or the Saudi ruling family, so yeah, can have both extremes. Um, this uh, situation in Iran, uh, what does it represent for the United States? Well, if you, I mean, even the Bush administration, uh, if you read the 2002, for instance, uh, national security. Uh, Document. So the first kind of strategic document produced by, by uh, Washington under George W. Bush and Rumsfeld and Cheney and all these guys. It made a difference between regime change in Iraq that was before the invasion, which they represented as being something that should be done through military action, and Iran, where they said this has to, be, to come from inside. Uh, it uh, it will come from inside. Regime change will be from inside. We 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 can't, w which means that we can't invade a country like Iran because it's uh, too large, too big, and we would face too many difficulties. But they thought that Iraq would be would be easy. This is also an, an acknowledgement of the fact that they knew that the uh, social constituency of the Iraqi regime of Saddam Hussein was narrow and it's a minority regime, whereas they knew that the social constituency, uh, constituency of the, the, the regime in Tehran was large, that it has a real mass base, and it's not like, it wasn't like uh, Saddam Hussein uh, uh, with uh, his rather uh, narrow one. Um, now, that's why uh, they, can't, they can't contemplate uh, anything more than sanctions. And especially now that they see a kind of the, 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 the fact that of betting on a regime sh change from inside, they see that vindicated and confirmed by the, what is happening in Iran. First time you have a real internal turmoil in Iran, and therefore the prospect of a possible change, uh, which uh, would not necessarily be that, I mean, that dramatic, but at least from within the regime a shift in policies is something that, be, well, uh, looks today or seems uh, uh, in the realm of, of, of what is possible, if not likely, at least what is possible. And therefore, they might think that was a, I mean, the, the real discussion in Washington about sanctions would be, and I can easily imagine the discussion. Discussion would be not, Will sanctions be effective in preventing the nuclear uh, you know, program from proceeding? I think. I think the major discussion is, will sanction help Ahmadinejad or not, or, or weaken it? Because actually they know that this regime, uh, and they can see how when faced with the internal uh, turmoil, the Ahmadinejad uh, regime uh, started uh, you know, sharpening its tone against the United States and on the nuclear issue and all that, because this is the only, I mean, the, the main uh, ideological argument exploiting uh, some kind of national pride that uh, Ahmadinejad has uh, facing his, uh, his opponents uh, within Iran. So um, here I think the, the Obama administration is very cautiously addressing this because they know that Iran has uh, important clout. They know that Iran has been relatively weakened with this problem of the internal turmoil, but still not completely. And uh, this issue of sanctions is contemplated now. Now, uh, I, I doubt, I mean, I haven't read the, the statement that you're referring uh, to, but um, uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine the Saudis uh, coming out in favor of uh, military attack on Iran. For them, this would be, an, uh, I mean, a huge uh, danger. I mean, a hugely risky, dangerous situation. 
so I think they would be the last people to advocate an armed attack on Iran in such conditions. I mean, it could ignite the whole region. They know that they are themselves very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, whatever they uh, face they, they want to show, but they know that the, their own situation is very tense. The, the, the Shia uh, region, the Shia province in the Saudi kingdom uh, is in a rebellious mood, and therefore, um, no, I think uh, the Saudis have rather advocated the talk to Iran kind of policy, and the Baker Hamilton, well, Baker is a close friend of the Saudis anyway. I mean, oil, you know, it's a, he's an oil man. He represents the Bush senior administration, which was, uh, for the Saudis, the best administration in US history because they had such uh, affinities, not with the Bush W, because this one was for them uh, a real problem, but Bush senior is, uh, you know, is very much uh, uh, regretted by, by, by them. So, um, yes, I, I think this, I mean, the, the whole thing, the Obama administration, is facing an Ahmadinejad, who for domestic reason is uh, increasing the tension on the issue of nuclear and all that. So the Obama administration cannot lose face in, in, in not reacting. They have to react, but uh, the problem for them is how to react and also how to react in a way that would not strengthen the very uh, uh, regime that they want or they dream of, uh, of getting rid of. Now, uh, the, the role of uh, Iran in Iraq. Uh, Iran built uh, uh, close relations with all three major sections of the Ira uh, Shia Iraqi forces. Uh, the Dawa, uh, the, of course, the Supreme Council, which is the most closely linked to Iran, but also Muqtad al uh, They built relations with them. They pretended not to interfere in their internal disputes, uh, and they could talk to each with a, a different language. Of course, Muqtad al-Sadr could you know, talk with the, you know, the anti-US rhetoric and all that. He, he, he would converge with that. Um, but basically, when you look at what Iran uh, is doing, Iran tries to uh, keep these fractions uh, cooperating together into uh, consolidating some form of, uh, of government that would be friendly to, to, to Iran. And, uh, well, and uh, in, in that sense, uh, uh, as I said, they even, I mean, they back the, the Maliki government uh, uh, because they, I mean, they believe that this is a, a friendly government for them. And, uh, and they, uh, uh, have an ambiguous attitude toward uh, the uh, U.S. presence in Iraq because it benefited them and the U.S. had been fighting uh, the Sunni insurgency for, uh, for some years, uh, so that was considered rather uh, positively in Iran. And now that uh, the United States shifted in 2006, uh, I mean, uh, there has been more tensions, but still uh, I would say they they have this uh, uh, policy of uh, building up uh, the links with uh, with all major uh, Shia forces there um, now Ch I mean China and I mean China uh, tries to to uh, develop relation I mean China is interested in the oil of course because it's the 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 Achilles heel, let's say, of one of the weakest points for China is this uh, dependence on uh, oil import. And the fact that the United States uh, went into control of the region is related, of course, uh, to a certain extent to the, the U.S. calculation of the importance of control over the oil there, even toward uh, China as a potential rival of, uh, of U.S. hegemony. So the, the China is busy diversifying its uh, sources of oil uh, everywhere from Latin America to uh, Africa uh, to the Middle East. And in Middle East, uh, they try to develop uh, wherever they can. Uh, so they have, they have uh, good positions in Iraq, actually. 
uh, and Iran. They have developed relations with Iran. But uh, China's role is, is, is limited because it doesn't have uh, the means of a global power. It's still, uh, uh, I mean, economically it's becoming a, a global power, but militarily, politically, it's not a global power. And uh, uh, what you have is uh, uh, the uh, both Russians and Chinese, uh, well, uh, trying to, I mean, developing relations with Iran, but at the same time, cautiously, because Iran uh, represents, uh, I mean, a regime built on Islamic fundamentalism, which is in itself perceived as a threat both from Beijing and uh, and Moscow. Uh, and that's also the complexity of the issue. But Iran is observer in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is the main arena for uh, uh, Chinese-Russian kind of strategic cooperation. Um, finally, the oil monarchies. Uh, I mean, the other members of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Um, the only one having, a, a, uh, let's say, a very original kind of uh, foreign policy is Qatar. Qatar is a strange case, also very, I mean, something you won't find but in the Middle East. It's a country where you have Israeli commercial representation and other kinds. You have the largest U.S military base and uh, the whole region, which is a sizable part of the territory of Qatar, actually, the, the, the U.S. military base in Qatar. Uh, and at the same time, the Qatari government supports Hezbollah, Syria, have a clo uh, friendly relations with Iran. So, I mean, again, uh, if you come with some kind of Western uh, or, or European or whatever kind of uh, uh, political framework and try to understand something there, you, you get lost. You get completely <laughs> lost. Basically, what is the Qatari government doing? The Qatari government is also historically at odds with the Saudis. Although they are also Wahhabis, the Qataris, people forget that, but it's a much uh, more liberal kind of <laughs> interpretation of Wahhabism. It's very that in itself is al already very peculiar. Uh, uh, they they, they resent the Saudis. They, they, I mean, there are frictions between the two. Uh, they need uh, uh, U.S. protection, both toward the Saudis, towards the Iran, of course, and, and all that. But at the same time, with their, let's say, uh, relations with the Saudis lead them to try to play a different card uh, in the region. Um, well, there has been an antecedent to that. Uh, uh, Kuwait in the past, before 1990. But Kuwait used to be, uh, of course, uh, I mean, dependent on Western military protection, British, US, and all that, but at the same time, uh, trying to play a kind of Arab nationalist uh, card in the region, until 1990. After 1990, of course, uh, they, I mean, don't try to play any kind of game like that, but they are completely dependent on, on US protection. and. Uh, they're not pretending anything else. So aside from Qatar, the, the, the rest don't have any real uh, autonomous kind of uh, policies. <laughs> you still have seven. <laughs> The U.S. intervening in the Middle East, to a certain extent, the administrations cannot be blamed for not understanding the situation there. Um, and I sort of have a two-pronged question. One of them is that for the U.S. to intervene directly in a country and use all their resources and all their power to change things, it seems a little bit ironic for them to then turn around and say, well, but it's so complicated, how can we understand it? Well, why did you decide to intervene to the extent that you're intervening if you have no idea what you're doing? Second of all, I mean, the U.S. has an interest, it seems, in maintaining a certain kind of a state in each one of the, the Arab nations or the Middle Eastern nations that it intervenes in. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, 
what is it that the U.S. means by a weak or a strong state? And, and which do they want? And which states do they want to be that way? Right? And furthermore, related to that, and this is still the same question, <laughs> is, I mean, it, it seems to me almost an impossibility for the U.S. to do what it does and yet want to maintain states in a certain status. That is, to attract a, a Middle Eastern nation to the U.S. and to their policies, the U.S. has to act at least like they are going to empower that nation somehow, either financially or politically or militarily or whatever. And yet, once they do that, then it seems like those states often get out of control by U.S. definitions. So how does that, how does all that fit into the U.S policies and intentions in the Middle East? How do they try to sort of keep the nation right here, not there, but not there either? Uh, you're referring to Iraq here? Or? Well, just any nation, you know, it, it, to, to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, for example, and this was the rhetoric a few years ago when Bush was sort of on his way out, was the Saudis are now this big danger. All of a sudden we woke up and we realized they're buying ports in the United States. Well, they've been doing that for 20 years. And not only that, they're buying them with money that we gave them for oil, or that we couldn't give them for oil, and now they're exchanging hard property in the U.S. for oil. So that it seems like this kind of ironic, hmm. twisted kind of thing that the U.S. is trying to do, which is simultaneously impossible, but in the short term, well, we can do it for as long as we can. Huh. So these were five of the seven. <laughs> <laughs> I take exception to your use of the term uh, Vietnam Syndrome, and um, I just... I said between the Of course. But I was just thinking perhaps was something else that was recognized the division in American society over this war and over, you know, that we do retain some, some semblance of civil society that, that rejects us. Okay, oh, oh, quite many there already. Um, <coughs> uh, well, I don't think that uh, the Bush administration, if they were conscious of the fact that uh, the situation was so complex, uh, that would have already meant that they were smarter than what they proved to be. I don't think they had this conscience of, of the complexity. But this is, uh, well, what I've called, if you're interested, you can find it on the internet. Uh, so that was um, um, contribution to a colloquium in uh, CUNY in New York. And it was published on, uh, I mean, without footnotes, but on uh, counterpunch. So it's called uh, uh, Bush, uh, uh, Bush's uh, uh, cakewalk into the Iraqi quagmire. Uh, and the, the subtitle was uh, 
you know, uh, self-deceptive, uh, uh, well, I don't remember exactly, but the issue here is that you have an administration that was warned by, uh, I mean, because there are a lot of people, of course, in the U.S. foreign, foreign policy establishment, there are a lot of people who understand the Middle East quite, quite well. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying that it's beyond uh, understanding. There are a lot of people who understand it quite well. But uh, the Bush administration did not want to listen to any, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, warning about the occupation of Iraq. They practiced self-intoxication, self-deception. They just listened to what they wanted to hear. Uh, anything confirming what they wanted to believe. And they had some Iraqis, Shalabi and company, uh, uh, you know, telling them what they wanted to uh, to believe, and I mean, think of it. In in uh, when they switch policies, they atta I mean, Shalabi was attacked by I mean, his uh, headquarters in Baghdad was ransacked by U.S. forces there, and he was accused of being a double agent. I mean, or you know, playing for Iran. He's, uh, I mean, yes. So you can see all that. Uh, th the fact is. Uh, they really believed that that would be like Germany and Japan after 45. This was the blueprint. And they tried to play it the same way. I mean, you had MacArthur in Japan, you know, and the Constitution and all that, so uh, designing the, the institutions. So they, they would have the same in Iraq, this uh, uh, occupation authority, which will uh, they thought will be able to uh, uh, I mean, uh, reshape the whole uh, country, reshape the institutions uh, and all that. And of course, it, it failed. It failed totally. Uh, and uh, one major reason uh, for, for, for which it, it failed um, is the attitude of someone they didn't expect to uh, uh, oppose. Their, their policies there, which is uh, who is uh, Ayatollah Sistani. And uh, well, he, well, he was, of course, more interested in increasing, uh, let's say, Sun, uh, Shia majority uh, uh, rule in, in, uh, in Iraq than uh, pleasing the United States. And, and therefore, he, I mean, he, he was decisive in the kind of confrontation which completely overturned the calculations of the Bush administration uh, in, in that country, which were very simplistic, uh, very simplistic calculations. And there, they had to pay for the fact that they had dismantled the Basi st state apparatus, and uh, therefore uh, they, they faced a situation which turned into chaotic, with an insurgency and all that facing them. And, uh, and well, of course, uh, in 2000, at the beginning of 2006, I mean, there was an improvement later on for the U.S. presence there, but beginning of 2006, everything looked as completely, completely disastrous there. Um, now, what, I mean, the blueprint, you know, initially the blueprint was, was that Iraq will turn into some kind of uh, Switzerland, you know, <laughs> with an army of 40,000. 40,000, that was the, the figure. I mean, this, yeah. And... Uh, uh, so a, a, a very weak state. Now, of course, the, this this has changed completely. And now, I mean, they are t uh, trying to, to, to. They understand that for the control of a state like Iraq, with all the contradictions, uh, what is needed is much stronger. And anyhow, they don't have really uh, much uh, choice on that level. Now, the issue of the Saudis. Um, uh, this was propagated by, by I mean, some people on the margins of the neocons themselves. And the neocons uh, had a certain discourse about the Saudis, which was never, never uh, any official line of the Bush administration. When uh, this famous guy uh, gave a presentation for Richard Perr's uh, Defense Policy Board, uh, presenting targets in the Saudi Kingdom, I mean, it made a scandal, but the guy was fired a few days after, immediately. I mean, bec uh, he had to be, uh, he was fired. Uh, and the, the, I mean, Bush, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, developed like his father, tried to develop uh, the closest possible links with the, uh, the, Saudi, uh, the Saudi rulers. And uh, the United States knows very well that the Saudi kingdom depends fully on the United States uh, for its protect. It's a protectorate. The Saudi kingdom is a U.S. protectorate. I mean, I have even described the Saudi kingdom as an Islamic Texas. <laughs> <laughs> the real 51st state of the United States is the Saudi kingdom and not Israel. Israel is 52nd. <laughs> uh, this, I mean, this is a state which is, I mean, co very closely dependent on the United States. And when I say in Islamic Texas, I mean, for those who have visited uh, both, I mean, I am not one of them, but anyone who has been to Texas and Saudi Kingdom can tell you about this, uh, the similarities, even in the landscape. <laughs> <laughs> but the other one is an Islamic version of that. Two oil states and closely dependent on, 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 on Washington. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Texas is part of the United States. I mean, uh, Saudi Kingdom is closely dependent on Washington. Uh, uh, the even you know, uh, a lot of the infrastructure which is uh, in the Saudi Kingdom is built for uh, American intervention, uh, U.S. intervention uh, purposes, and they have a, a lot of pre-positioned material. I mean, this a huge uh, buying of weapons by the Saudi Kingdom, which makes the Saudi Kingdom, you know, one of the most important uh, buyers of, of weapons in the world, uh, with an effect, uh, military effectiveness uh, very, very low one. I mean, the Saudi Kingdom uh, spends for its military much more than Israel, for instance. And, I mean, of course, they don't uh, reach 10% uh, of the effectiveness of, of Israel militarily. But be because most of what they buy, it's a matter of pre-positioning uh, weaponry for the United States. So this is a country which is really completely dependent on uh, U.S. protection. And the more it feels threatened by its environment, actually, the more uh, this dependency is uh, strengthened. And of course, Iran is a major reason for the Saudi Kingdom. And before Iran, Iraq, and you know, you had uh, one after the other, before Iraq, uh, Nasser. And, uh, so there were so many uh, uh, threats for the Saudi Kingdom, which the Saudi Kingdom could only fa face with uh, U.S. protection. And that's why, I mean, to believe that the Saudis are any kind of threat to the United States, it, it's just uh, you know, uh, fantasy. It doesn't work like that, and uh, I mean the 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 Saudis, uh, even in their oil policy, is basically something which takes very much into consideration U.S. interests. Uh, their policy about oil prices and everything. Their their intervention in the market, and it's also one of the reasons why they are such an uh, important asset for the United States. So uh, that's also why, uh, from of all the countries in the region, the Saudi Kingdom is by far the main priority for the United States. And I mean, uh, it's absolutely clear that any threat to the regime in the United States will lead to direct U.S. intervention. I mean, there's no doubt about that. The United States will not stand to lose the Saudi Kingdom. They can't afford to lose the Saudi Kingdom. That's very clear. And the, the, this policy also meant from the, 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 the beginning of the build-up of the relation, uh, the way the United States uh, uh, behaved with the Saudi Kingdom was actually to uh, uh, bet on the traditionalism of the regime as a safeguard against changes, regime change in the Saudi Kingdom. And that's how they, they functioned with it. Um, the, the, the Vietnam... Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not I mean, uh, the f the phrase Vietnam syndrome uh, would uh, uh, tend to lead people believe that this is some kind of disease. And of course, certainly from seen from the Pentagon or, or Washington, this is uh, uh, a disease of uh, American uh, youngsters. Let's say the U.S. youngsters, the, the youth, at least at the time of Vietnam and all that. But of course. I completely agree with you. I mean, this is not a disease, and it's true to, uh, uh, on the contrary. I mean, it shows that, uh, I would say, the, the weakest, uh, I mean, the Achilles heel of uh, U, the U.S. imperial power is not economic, as people believe. Of, of course, I mean, we, we can, uh, don't have time to get into a discussion on the economic side. We, have some dis we had some discussion at UNAM uh, a few hours ago. 
Uh, but the Achilles heel of U.S. imperial power is the U.S. population, the U.S. US. And uh, uh, that was clearly seen at the time of Vietnam. Uh, you can see that uh, in all military respects, uh, present-day United States is much stronger than the time of Vietnam, except in one, troops. There, there is now less than half the number of troops that you had at the time of, uh, I mean, the, the, the OD, Department of Defense uh, personnel that you had at the time of Vietnam. And uh, uh, there's no possible way in present condition one can think of a U.S. government uh, reinstating the, the draft, for instance, in the United States, the conscription, the, the military uh, compulsory service. And we can see all the difficulties that the Pentagon has in recruiting, uh, real difficulties in, in, uh, in meeting the, uh, the targets for, for recruitment. But uh, the, the, the whole strategy that was revised in the light of Vietnam, after Vietnam, uh, the so-called, uh, um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the strategy in which uh, Colin Powell, for instance, when he was uh, chief of staff, uh, played a, a major role, uh, is one which was based on the lesson of Vietnam, and the number one lesson was do not rely on, uh, on, uh, on the soldiers. I mean, it's a shift in the nature of war into a technological war. What uh, someone, I mean, what uh, uh, Lutwak uh, called post-heroic war, in the sense that heroism, I mean, fighting and all that, was, I mean, now it's, uh, you know, striking from a distance with all kind of gadgetry that, uh, that they have. But this is, this, they developed this. The major miscalculation when it comes to Iraq, I mean, was not to understand that well, you, you can defeat any army with uh, technological, uh, such, I mean, the crushing te technological superiority. But you can't control a population with drones and remote control weapons. For that, you need infantry, you need troops on the ground. And they found themselves, the Pentagon found it itself in, in Iraq in a situation they couldn't control. In a sense, they knew that, we know that parts of the, the the brass in the Pentagon, before the invasion of Iraq, warned that it takes much more troops than what Rumsfeld uh, uh, was uh, ready to, to concede. They told him and they paid the price for that. But he wouldn't listen to that. Why? Because had he listened to that, he would have known that the number of troops, therefore, that they were saying it would require to, to, to keep the country under, under occupation, is something which would stretch uh, uh, the uh, uh, U.S. potential to extremely dangerous limits. And that's what happened ultimately, where they really got into imperial overstretch, to borrow the phrase of, uh, of Paul Kennedy uh, about uh, the United States, which was a, a, a wrong assessment at that time, but uh, in Iraq at least uh, that was uh, the correct phrase to, 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 to be applied. Um, well, and uh, I mean, is this are this uh, are these successive mis mis miscalculations uh, benefiting some someone? Well, they always benefit someone, of course. Uh, those who are on the other side. I mean, uh, here we, we said Iran has been by far the main beneficiary of uh, of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, miscalculation in Iraq. Uh, th that's uh, absolutely clear. So every time you you have some people, but uh, th these, I mean, this miscalculation uh, represented a major uh, setback for uh, the uh, imperial designs of the United States. Absolutely, a major one. Um, well, I was quoting uh, a few hours ago. I mean, the terms you would, if you if you take people like. Uh, two probably most well, uh, the, the best known, uh, the two best known uh, figures of uh, the U.S. foreign policy establishment, Brzezinski and uh, Kissinger. Uh, one, uh, Brzezinski called the, the Iraq uh, uh, situation a catastrophe for, for the United States, and it's not a very... <laughs> And, uh, and Kissinger, although he, he tried to be milder because he's a Republican, uh, but uh, explained in the form of warning that failure in Iraq 
would be much worse than Vietnam. And we have to be conscious of that, that it's true that it's, I mean, in the same way that, as I said, uh, uh, the withdrawal from Vietnam was compensated by the gains for a few years before Iran uh, in the Middle East through Egypt, uh, for the same reason, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the United States cannot afford to, uh, you know, face a defeat in the Middle East in, uh, uh, comparable to what they faced in Vietnam. They can't just leave like, like they did in, uh, in Vietnam. It's not possible. Uh, when the Obama administration says we will withdraw troops from Iraq, well, on the one hand, they, are, they have built so many bases so that one uh, wonders how, how they will uh, implement this kind of pledge. But on the other hand, what they have in mind is keeping, of course, a very strong military presence all around and uh, uh, maintaining forms of military cooperation with the Iraqi government and some form of tutelage. They can't afford to, 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 uh, to leave the region, the region and, uh, of course, they diversify their military bases in the region. Qatar, I mentioned, is one of them. But if you look at the number of U.S. military bases, the concentration of U.S. military bases around the Gulf is amazing. It's amazing. Just look at any map of these military bases, and you will see this amazing concentration of bases in the region because of the huge strategic importance of, uh, of that region. And finally, because this is a completely, uh, well, not completely, this is a different issue, um, the Obama administration and Palestine, well, as I said, I will repeat, uh, the ability of any U.S. government to exert pressure on Israel is uh, inversely proportional, I would put it in mathematical uh, terms, uh, to uh, the need of the United States for uh, Israel. Uh, yeah. And it is in 1991, at, at the time when the U.S. administration believed that Israel and in Israel, you had anxiety, terrible anxiety in 1991. Have we lost our strategic values to the United States? That was a big you know, question in Israel. There was this anxiety that we are getting. Uh, we will get you know, uh, into a kind of secondary position. And that's the time when the, the Bush senior administration uh, really exerted very strong pressure on the Shamir government uh, kind of blackmail, you know, threatening or refusing to uh, uh, offer a guarantee for a $10 billion loan that uh, the Shamir government uh, needed. Uh, and so they really forced the Shamir government to go to Madrid, to, the, to go to start the, the, the peace process uh, and all that. Uh, now, I mean, the, the, if you take Bush, I mean, the, the, the previous administration or this one, Ever since this whole occupation of Iraq uh, turned sore and uh, uh, turned into a quagmire, uh, any ability for the administration, whatever their intent, to exert pressure, on, uh, I mean, effective pressure on Israel, is very limited. And that's why I said, I mean, the Israeli government knows that very well. Netanyahu knows, knows very well that, the, that Washington is not in a position with the problems in Iraq, Afghanistan, and all that, is not in a position to exert a strong pressure. And then, therefore, they feel free to do what, what they want. They are doing what they want, you know, expanding settlements and all that, uh, you know, uh, going against uh, uh, official U.S. policy. But they, 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 they don't mind. They don't care. They, they know that, they, I mean, uh, uh, Washington is not in a position to prevent them from doing anything. Now, uh, how this administration is trying to cope with all that? Well, the, uh, I mean, uh, they are in such a situation that uh, one gets the feeling that they don't have any kind of, uh, of uh, mid-term perspective, not to speak of long-term. Uh, they, 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 they really are navigating at sight, I mean, uh, uh, 
I mean, you have the, the division between Hamas and, uh, and uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, uh, well, they know that uh, Mahmoud Abbas doesn't have the force to, uh, to, to get hold of, of, of Gaza. Uh, they uh, bet on the Egyptians for, uh, for that. The Egyptian exert uh, pressure on, on uh, Abbas uh, to collaborate with the Israelis. The, the Saudis are part of the picture. I mean, it's uh, the, the, the Palestinian situation uh, appears as uh, at a kind of dead end. It appears as a kind of dead end. And uh, no one see what is the way out of this kind of dead end, the Palestinian-Israeli kind of conflict. And that's why, I mean, this one of the reasons that is part, I mean, of the very tragic kind of situation in which we are in the, in the region. I mentioned that uh, at UNAM, but uh, the, the whole region is living its, I mean, probably the most tragic moment of its history when you think of the accumulation of disasters in Iraq and this terrible, bloody civil war which is uh, going on there when you think of uh, the repeated wars in, in Lebanon, the, the 2006 very destructive one, and the tense situation that exists around Lebanon, as uh, I said, the likelihood of a new Israeli offensive is, uh, is it's rather high. And when you think of, of Palestine and the civil war and all that, and, well, Yemen, uh, I mean, it's explosion everywhere. It's explosion everywhere. It's, it, uh, and, and, you know, this destabilization of the region, uh, this so-called constructive uh, instability, to the neocon policy, well, was very successful, one could say, but it, it, it is not constructive at all for U.S. interest, uh, at least uh, for, for the time being. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.